Hello beautiful people, welcome to A Doctor's View, a show where we discuss the medical relevance of some of the most iconic scenes in movies and TV series. And as always, I'll be joined by the very best in the healthcare industry right here in the heart of London. Today, I'm being joined by Dr. Emma to discuss Black Panther. This episode is being done in honor of Chadwick Boseman, who so sadly recently passed on. Roll intro. Hello, Dr. Emma. It's nice to have you back with us. Hello, I'm happy to be back. That's lovely. Can you briefly introduce yourself to those who might not know who you are? Uh, so, my name is Dr. Emma. I'm a dermatology registrar working in Southwest London. Today, we have lots to discuss, so let's go right in it. First clip, let's roll it. Wow, remember this part of the movie? Yeah, this is one of my favorite parts. It just showed sheer determination exactly and strength and the resilience yeah. wow that's a stuff really nasty one see that determination literally the power wow dr emma we all just saw a man stab another with <laughs> a very ancient spear what did you see yep yeah, so um i would use this opportunity to talk about stab wounds okay so um the the problem with stab wounds is that, of course, the instrument that's causing the injury, it all depends on what structures and tissues that instrument passes through, and that determines the level or the amount of damage that the person will suffer from. Can you quickly run us through what will happen if it's stabbed through the skin all the way to the lungs and if it moved all the way to the heart? Mm, so, yeah, of course, in this um, clip, he was stabbed with a very long spear, so there's yeah. the potential to do a lot of damage. Massive damage. Just speaking very superficially, of course, the first layer that you could cause some damage to is the skin. And you've got to remember that there are lots of blood vessels in the skin, so even quite superficial stabs can cause a lot of bleeding. Behind the skin, you've then got the intercostal muscles, basically the muscles around the chest and the rib cage. And if the instrument successfully gets through those, you then have access to the lung. Now, damage to the lung is interesting because the lung is actually covered in two coats, if you like, two layers of membrane called the pleura. An interesting thing happens when you damage the pleura. The, you can have something called a pneumothorax or a hemothorax. Okay. A pneumothorax is where you pierce the lung and you get air trapped in between those two layers. And the hemothorax is where you get blood trapped in between those two layers. Often in injuries, actually, you get a mixture of the two, and it's called a hemoneumothorax or a pneumohemothorax. I can't remember which one now. <laughs> I, I think it works both ways, and it's quite a long word the hemoneumothorax, okay? Yeah. So that's where you have a mixture of both blood and air trapped in between the two layers that line the lung. This is a problem because as the accumulation of either blood or air or both builds up, it then traps the lung underneath and then that lung is unable to do its work of actually allowing the person to breathe. And what happens if that same spear had gone through the heart? Hmm, so the heart is just um, a chamber that holds a lot of blood. So you can imagine if that spear pierces the heart, you're going to have massive hemorrhage, basically bleeding. And also the heart won't be able to perform its function of pumping blood around the body. So that could cause death pretty quickly. Pretty quickly actually. It's like the final scene of every movie being shot through the heart. <laughs> yeah. So how about what do I do if I see a friend of mine being stabbed? Yeah, so if you happen to witness a stabbing or you see someone that has been stabbed, the first thing you do in any emergency situation is call for help. You don't want to be managing such a situation on your own. The next thing to do is if the instrument that was used to stab the person is still in situ, leave it well alone. Don't try and pull it out, don't try and manipulate it in any way because that can actually cause more damage. If possible, it's good to apply some pressure around the stab wound because this should hopefully reduce the bleeding. But again, only do this if you can do it safely without you know, manipulating the instrument any further. Then you, what you want to do is try and keep the person calm. If they're still awake, try and talk to them and keep them awake for as long as possible until help arrives. 
if it looks like they're becoming dizzy and starting to you know pass faint or look like they're about to pass out it's a good idea to raise their legs because that will allow whatever blood they have in their body to rush towards their head and keep them awake wow that's a very good advice to to keep note of um we have a lot to talk about as i said earlier on let's move on to the second clip let's do it Ah, yeah. the purple stuff. Yeah, he's drinking that up. Ew, would you even try that? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I don't live in a mythical land called Wakanda. <laughs> you don't want to shout Wakanda forever! <laughs> oh, well, wow. Now, I think this is the spiritual realm, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. I think that's the um, idea they are going with with the movie, right? Mm -hmm. But all we can see is that he is definitely hallucinating. <laughs> so, what did you see, Dr. Emma? So, I suppose what we really saw was a man drink a certain substance and then start to hallucinate, which is actually quite um, realistic. Yeah, very <laughs> realistic. Yeah, so there are certain drugs that cause hallucinations. One such drug um, that I think most people would have heard of is LSD. Yeah. Um, and I think it has a few street names like Acid or Lucy or um, Blots and other stuff. I think it gets a new street name every two years. So yeah, we, um, we are far back on that yeah, name. Yeah, those are the ones I don't, <laughs> I don't know of anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, so LSD um, is classified as a hallucinogen and people take it because it makes them sort of feel, you know, different and out of touch with the reality. Can you explain what really happens when somebody takes something like that? So from doing the, some research, I know that hallucinogens were used in a few religious practices years ago. Um, I know that certain tribes and cultures around the world would take hallucinogens and it would help them to have spiritual awakenings or spiritual experiences. Yeah. Um, and then of course I think in the 60s we know that a lot of hippies were taking things like LSD because it made people feel a lot more calm and people would sort of see things that made them feel a bit trippy and it was, um, from what I understand, you know, very pleasurable. So Dr. Emma, from what you're saying, it's all positive so far. Are, are there any other sides to the drug actually? Yeah, so from my understanding, the drugs that um, cause people to hallucinate will just magnify how that person is already feeling. So if you're feeling calm and you take a certain drug like LSD, it may make you feel more calm and more relaxed. But however, if the person is anxious or frightened, it can just heighten that feeling and people have very, very terrifying experiences after trying these drugs. Wow, even looking at panthers in trees looks horrific to me too. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's really important to note that nobody knows which category they're going to fall into before they take the drug okay. and some people can have really horrible experiences even taking the drug for the first time people can also get a permanent psychosis where they continue to hallucinate even without taking any lsd and people can also have really bad flashbacks sometimes years after trying the drug so really it's not worth the risk yeah, from what you're saying, it seems it has some long-term implications mm. that's not worth the immediate satisfaction or gratification, I should say. Yeah. Moving on. Wow. You remember the scene? Yeah. I was crazy rooting scene. for him. I expected <laughs> him to just come up just like the first scene. Yeah, I couldn't believe he didn't win, to be honest. Because wow. he's the main character. I couldn't yeah. believe it. It was, it was a twist in the, the whole movie. Wow. And off he goes. Gosh. Wow. That left his car. <laughs> Dr. Emma, we are all seeing a man just being thrown over the ledge into the bottom of a river. What do you see? Yeah, so this would be a really good opportunity to talk about drowning. Excellent. Can you tell us more? Yeah, so I suppose one thing I would like to emphasize is that drowning doesn't always look like it does in the films, in that someone who's drowning isn't always kicking and screaming and making lots of noise. What usually kills people in drowning is that they use all their energy trying to keep their head above the water. Mm -hmm. So by the time anyone spots them, they may actually just be exhausted and they may be just floating, you know, very quietly or just sunk at the bottom of the body of water. So it's really important to not just think that somebody's not drowning because they seem calm. Okay, so if 
I witness someone drowning, how can I be of help to the person? Mm, so it's really important to make sure that you don't put yourself in danger. If you feel like you're able, you of course want to remove them from the body of water and get them to a safe place. Once you've done that, um, you want to check if they're still awake. So, you know, give them a good shake, you know, shout in their ear, make sure that you, there's no response. If they don't respond, it's usually a good idea to turn them over to their side very briefly to see if any water comes out of their, you know, their mouth if they start coughing. If there's still no response, you want to put them on their back, check if they're breathing and check for a pulse. If there's none of those things, then you need to start resuscitation and that's in the form of chest compressions. I believe to take them out of danger zone into a safe place, you need to be a good swimmer, don't you? Yeah, so it's really important not to put yourself in danger. And I think also let's emphasize at this stage yeah. that people don't just drown in rivers or swimming pools. Sometimes people drown in bathtubs. True. and especially children True. so young children can drown in bathtubs and they should never be left alone in the bath back to the chest compression how is it performed mm, so chest compressions need to be performed um, with your two hands on the person's chest and you want to do about 100 to 120 chest compressions per minute every time we're taught how to do these we're told to sing a song <laughs> um, and the song goes ha 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 ha, staying alive, staying alive. <laughs> and um, yeah, so now I've sung on YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> it's there forever. It's there forever. <laughs> the song basically tells you how fast to go. It makes you keep um, the correct rhythm so that you can achieve the 100 to 120 beats per minute. And is there any new updates on the need to do mouth to mouth? Yeah, so in line with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, most guidelines are now saying that you don't need to do the mouth-to-mouth -mouth, um, delivery of air, you can just do chest compressions. And really we've known for a long time that in the whole resuscitation process, it's the chest compressions that keep someone alive. So do concentrate on giving good quality chest compressions. Okay, I think we are slowly putting an end to the mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. I have never done that, I was never looking forward to doing that, <laughs> but hey, here we are. Yeah, um, Dr. Emma, before we let you go, um, can you touch briefly on colorectal cancer? It's been said in the news that that's what caused the death of Chadwick Boseman. Yeah, um, I think it's really, really important that we touch on this. Um, I was really surprised to hear that he passed away from colorectal cancer because he was very young. He was only 43 um, and we usually see deaths from colorectal cancer in people that are much older. But I think it's you know an ample opportunity to raise awareness and um, educate the public. So colorectal cancer is very common. It's okay. the fourth most common cancer in the UK Jeez. and it affects about one in 20 people. It's actually the second most common cause of cancer deaths in the UK. So mm -hmm. it should definitely be taken seriously. Can, can you tell me any signs or symptoms I should be looking out for if I believe I have colorectal cancer? Mm, so things to look out for um, include the presence of blood in the stool. This is not normal. It's never normal to have blood in the stool. There are okay. other causes, so it doesn't mean that you have cancer, but blood in the stool should always be investigated and not ignored. Other things um, include change in bowel habits. So a lot of people, as they grow into adulthood, know how their bowels work. They know okay. how many times per week or per day they open their bowels. And any change where people become either more constipated or they have diarrhea for a prolonged period of time should prompt um, seeing a medical professional. Another thing includes like, persistent abdominal pain or bloating and okay. discomfort. So how will I know if I'm at risk of also developing colorectal cancer in the future? Mm, so certain risk factors um, should be kept in mind. The most important one is age. Okay. Um, so 90% of people who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer are over the age of 60. Of course, there's nothing you can do to change your age, but there are some risk factors that you can modify. Um, one of them is being overweight and also being physically inactive. So if you are overweight, it's a really good idea to lose weight and to increase your levels of physical activity, make sure you're doing some exercise. Is there, is there any form of screening program here in the UK to help us detect quickly if we do have colorectal cancer or not? Yeah, in the NHS we have an amazing screening program. Wonderful. So at the age of 55, everyone will be invited to do a single bowel screening scope. 
Now, this is not the most pleasant of examinations, I will be honest. It basically involves um, a small tube being put up the backside to look at the bowel via a camera to see if there's anything sinister. Um, after that, if that's all normal, in between the ages of 60 to 74, everyone will be invited to do a home testing kit every two years. This is really, really simple. The testing kit gets sent to your house. You put a small amount of your poo on the testing kit and send it back and then they get in contact with you to tell you whether it's abnormal or not. Past the age of 75, um, there's no routine screening program, but you can request to be screened if you're concerned. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Um, the details of Dr. Emma will be right up on screen to follow her up on Instagram. And also before I let you go, as always, our trivial question for today. What is the medical term for blood and air but trapped in the lung covering? As always, write your comments down below and we'll see who gave the right one. Thank you so much and it's been a pleasure. My name, Dr. A. Oh, <laughs>